I was doing the courses in Portsmouth at the various schools, gunnery, torpedo, signals and navigation. And I was woken up along with a lot of other sub-lieutenants and told that we were required to go and rescue the army. My first try at that was not successful. My number wasn't called and I was told to go back to the gunnery school where we were housed and carried on with my schoolwork. And I did. Then, about a week later, I was again called at the gone godly hour of 0200 and taken to the naval barracks where I was detailed off with five other sub-lieutenants and portioned out with a crew, each with a crew of one leader a leading seaman, four seamen, one engine room artificer, one leading stoker and one second class stoker and that we were going to have to man six Dutch coasters which were lying in Poole Harbour under the care of three or four Dutchmen who were the engineers for these ships. We were told we were going to go to France to make another rescue as the 51st Highland Division was trapped above the cliffs and beach at St. Valerie and we sailed independently out of Pool Harbour and made our way to St. Valerie and we were told not to keep grouped up in case uh, we were hurried by the German Air Force and we arrived off St. Valerie Beach at about day about daybreak everything at that time seemed fairly quiet and we were met by a destroyer which shepherded us we had no communication with the destroyer except that the officers on the bridge of the destroyer communicated with us by megaphone and told us what we had to do. When we got to St. Valerie, the destroyer was attacked by the German Air Force in a very spectacular, although they were Heinkels, they did some pretty steep dive bombing to try and hit the destroyer. But the destroyer, which had been proceeding at very slow speed, managed to accelerate so quickly up to about 20 to 25 knots and all the bombs landed quite away astern of the destroyer. One of the things the destroyer arranged was for one of our coasters under the command of my friend John Pryor was he was told to go in towards the beach to find out what was happening because there did not seem to be any activity on the beach. Pryor's coaster went in towards the beach and came under fire and was unfortunately hit and old and came to a, a stop and we had to leave him there. What eventually happened was his coaster grounded when the tide went out and he and his crew were taken prisoner by a number of German soldiers who came walking along the beach and told them to march off and joined up with the, some of the soldiers of the 51st Division. I heard about this later after the war when I met John Pryor when he'd been released after five years in a German prison camp near Bremen, where they had been taken, walked all the way, marched all the way from St. Valerie to the North German coast. He, in fact, had managed to escape from the prison camp twice, but was captured once by police trying to get into the docks. The next time when he escaped, he got on board a Swedish vessel, which was trading between Sweden and Germany, and one of the crew summoned German police, and again, he was back in the prison camp where he stayed for five years. The other coasters was told by the destroyer to follow him and we went further west to make for Le Havre with the idea of seeing if we could take off some of the uh, also men from the 51st Division who were in Le Havre but were, as far as we know, knew were surrounded. When we got to off Le Havre we were told by the captain of the destroyer that we weren't needed because the Germans had captured all the British soldiers that were there and that they controlled the port and the beach and we were told to make our way independently back to England. They did not say where in England we were to go but in fact we went to Weymouth and waited for our next assignment. 
After we'd had about, I, th I think, two days in Weymouth, we were told to go to Cherbourg to see if we could help in getting British troops back from there. And we went independently to Cherbourg and were not molested at all. The only war activity we could see is when we were passing Fécamp, which was under a great cloud of explosives, and we carried on to Cherbourg, went into Cherbourg, where we followed two British Rail ferries which were going towards the transatlantic terminal, the terminal where all Cunadas and French liners embarked their passengers to go to New York. At that time, the ocean terminal was still standing, had not been damaged at all. But we were told that we would be required, in case any of the British ferry steamers uh, couldn't make it or were damaged, we were there and waited, and we would be there mainly to take off, if necessary, any demolition parties. We were bombed on the way in. The target the German aircraft were on were, were the steamers, but my jabber was rather close to one of the steamers and a bomb fell between the steamer and the jabber and didn't do much damage to the ship but it started a leak in the engine room which we had to put up with. In effect when the steamer, the uh, railway steamers had left we were told to go alongside. While alongside in Cherbourg, I sent the two stokers ashore to see if they could scrounge some cement and sand to allow the, the engine room artificer to repair the leak in the boiler room caused by the bomb explosion while we were entering Cherbourg. They managed to find so much rubble on the quayside that there was, it didn't take them very long to find a sack of cement and a sack of sand which they brought on board and the engine room artificer made a pretty quick sandbox to contain the leak in the between the plates in the engine room and that lasted that did its job for the rest of the time that I was on board the Jabba and we embarked about 300 soldiers of various regiments. They weren't particularly well organized. They'd had a bad time. They were, they'd never had any sleep, and they'd been harried by the German Air Force, and they weren't a very alert-looking lot, but they'd had a bad time. And we then steamed out of Cherbourg, and as I was about to go with the Jabba out through the eastern gap between the eastern mole and the detached mole, just before that, we passed a little dinghy, a rain dinghy, which contained a French naval officer and about four French seamen, whose job had been to place demolition charges on the fort at the eastern end of the detached mole. And the French officer fortunately told us that we'd be very ill-advised to go out through that entrance, as he expected his explosives to be operated in a few minutes' time. And I was very glad that we then turned about and went out through the western entrance and we saw the explosives on the eastern entrance which we would have been very close to it if we'd continued. We then left Cherbourg and proceeded north on our own together with the other coaster and made for Weymouth. Although the soldiers were from various units and weren't particularly well organized, they had had a hard time and they'd been harried by German Air Force. I don't think at that time they then had any contact with the German army, but they were dog-tired and almost as soon as they got on board, they either slept in the hold on the deck or on the upper deck. And we steamed gently in beautiful weather to Weymouth, where they disembarked. We were not attacked at all by German Air Force. The only thing we gained from that trip was one of the soldiers was kind enough to leave two brain guns with his ammunition, and that became our main armament for the rest of the time I was in the Jabba. Up to that time, the main armament of the Jabba was the pistol which I had round my waist in a holster. The crew I had of a leading seaman, who was a fat, lazy fellow, and four able and ordinary seamen, one of whom I had known previously in my service in Hood, who had been in pain in the whatnot by never being where he was wanted, was lazy and often was absent from leave, and I had asked at the time when I was portioned with him in the barracks, I had asked the officer who was doing that 
if you could possibly remove him and put him in another party. He said, no, this is your pigeon. You're going to make the most of it. I went back and had a word with this man and said, I remember him from my previous encounter with him in my previous ship. And if I have any trouble at all while in the face of the enemy and I tapped my revolver holster and he came out and said, I understand what you mean, sir. He was no more trouble for the rest of the time. While in Weymouth, we restocked our supply of food, mainly consisting of corned beef biscuits and also of great tins of fresh water for the next trip. The next trip happened to be to the Channel Islands to evacuate any civilians that wanted to come to England to, as it was realised that it wouldn't be very long before the Germans would occupy the Channel Islands. Two of our coasters went first to Jersey, where we went alongside and waited for the civilians to come. Also coming into the Jersey Harbour was one railway cross-channel ferry steamer, and it burst alongside. And we were told that we probably would not be required to evacuate the civilians, because they would all get on board, all that wanted to go got on board the Channel steamer which when it left we left as well and instead of going back to England we were told to go to Guernsey well we went alongside again and we did in fact evacuate about 250 civilians they were told by the resident naval officer in Guernsey that anyone wanting to make themselves comfortable could take any cushions seats or anything else out of their cars and would make a more comfortable journey than if they had to sleep or lie on the deck or in the hold, which they did. Also, we stocked up to a remarkable extent from the hundreds of crates of tomatoes waiting to be shipped to England. When we got back to Weymouth, I was told that I would be taken back to Portsmouth to carry on with my courses, and I was relieved by a Royal Naval Reserve officer, and what happened to the Jabba after that, I don't do not know. My next interruption for my courses at Portsmouth was when we were detailed off to take over and safeguard any French warships which had escaped from France and taken shelter in British ports. Quite a large number of French ships, including an old battleship, came to Portsmouth and it was decided by the government that these should be neutralised in an operation taken on by sailors at, as far as I was concerned, Portsmouth. The particular group of ships which I was concerned with were three very modern destroyers which were berthed on one of the outside berths in Portsmouth Dockyard. And as usual with all these things, the muster of the people who had to do it was always in the middle of the night. And again, I went to Portsmouth Gymnasium and we collected a number of sailors and marines who would go armed to take over, in my case, three destroyers which were berthed close alongside. We marched from the barracks through the dockyard at night and of course at that time it, it was wartime blackout and positioned ourselves round the dock where these three ships were and a number of sailors and marines were placed on the stern of a ship which was being built in a dry dock in a slipway overlooking where these French ships were. We were told that we had to take these ships under control and that there was to be no violence if it could be avoided. The officer in charge of the parties which were taking these three ships was a French speaker and he was issued with a number of cards which he had to distribute first of all to the captains of the three ships so that they themselves could distribute these cards to their sailors. At about daybreak, the captain went on board the nearest destroyer and spoke to the quartermaster on duty and showed him a card and said, asked him to take him to the captain's cabin and he roused the captain and told the captain that he had men surrounding the three ships and he intended to take over and to give the French sailors an opportunity of what they could do and would he please arrange with the other two captains to get all the sailors off the ships and into the on the dockside and for him to be able to address the three ships company. 
The nearest destroyer was called the Leopard and my job was to make sure that when I went on board with an armed crew was to make sure that the entry to the boiler rooms and engine rooms was sealed off to prevent any risk of the French sailors scuttling their ships. Then a party of sailors went round with French sailors rousing the ship's companies and told them to get dressed and on to the dockside where the three captains spoke to their men and gave them the options that they had, which would be that they could either join the Free French forces or be repatriated under safe conduct arranged with the Germans to take them back to work as civilians in France. This operation was carried out strictly in accordance with the wishes of the British government and went fairly well. The only casualty in the whole operation in Portsmouth was when two officers, one British and one French officer, shot each other when the British sailors occupied the big French submarine Sarkouf. Everything else was done in a very friendly fashion. The only thing which was not planned and was quite somewhat out of order but didn't really matter was the fact that in one of the ships the sailors got hold of the stock of wine and had far too much to drink and started sh shouting and singing. But it was all done in a somewhat, somewhat friendly fashion. When we had to board the three destroyers, of which the one nearest jetty was called the Leopard, one of the officers in the Leopard I had met the previous summer in the Firth of Forth when the home fleet of the French Navy gathered with the British home fleet for a joint manoeuvres. And I was in the destroyer Bedouin doing my small ship's time and half the flotilla, the destroyers, was detailed to look after and be host ship for a French cruiser called the Georges Leg. And I got to know quite well one of the French officers in the Georges Leg. And I found that when I boarded this destroyer later, he had transferred from the Georges Leg to the Leopard. And we greeted each other and it was not a very well-meaning liaison. I remember his remark that it was not a very nice thing for one ally to take over the ships of its friendly ally.